Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today's video is the first of what should be a couple of videos throughout the week centering around CES, which is still happening this year as a virtual show where a bunch of companies are all getting together to talk about new tech products. We're not going to spam up your feed with a billion different news videos just rehashing what you could have already learned in official live streams, but we will be jumping in a couple of times to offer our thoughts on the big announcements from Intel, AMD and Nvidia, as well as other products that may be of interest. This video, today's video, is focused on Intel's announcements, which should have just finished if I've got the timing right here. We were pre-briefed by Intel on these announcements, so I'm going to give you a few of my thoughts on what was shown off. Tomorrow we'll be talking about AMD and Nvidia, although there are no pre-briefings scheduled, so you can expect our thoughts well after the events are finished, given we aren't waking up at 3am local time to watch them. So at CES this year, there is going to be a strong focus on mobile hardware, and tomorrow we are expecting AMD to announce their Ryzen Mobile 5000 lineup, along with Nvidia announcing the RTX 30 series for mobile. Intel are wanting to sneak in first to talk about their products, and while in my opinion they aren't as exciting as what we should have from the other two companies, just based on what Intel actually has ready at the moment, there's still a few things to talk about though. I'm going to start with the end of Intel's presentation first and talk about their teaser for 11th gen desktop processors, Rocket Lake S. There have been a ton of leaks and rumors surrounding these parts over the last few months, but Intel aren't ready to unveil the full lineup today. We're expecting that to happen sometime in March, as it seems these parts aren't quite finalized just yet. However, Intel do want to talk about some of the features and deliver a small preview of the Core i9 11900K. So these are the basics. A new core architecture is being used. Intel aren't talking specifics, but this is expected to be a backport of Intel's Sunny Cove architecture to 14 nanometers. This brings with it up to a 19% IPC improvement, according to Intel, which is in line with what they've previously described for Sunny Cove when it first launched in 10 nanometer Ice Lake processors. There's also going to be a new integrated graphics core with up to 50% better performance. You can see the full breakdown of features here for the 11900K, and basically a lot of this stuff is as expected given what we saw from Intel's mobile processors that have already been using a variant of this architecture. So stuff like faster memory support, DDR4-3200, and new accelerated media capabilities like AV1 decoding are found here. What's interesting to see is Intel confirming the core configuration and clock speed for the 11900K. We're getting 8 cores and 16 threads, so a drop down from 10 cores, but clock speeds remain high at up to 5.3 GHz single core and 4.8 GHz all core turbo. These are with thermal velocity boost, but still what Intel is saying here is there has been no decrease to the peak clock speeds from the new architecture being backported onto an existing node. The 10900K did up to 5.3 GHz and so does the 11900K. Intel are also confirming a new PCIe configuration with support for PCIe 4.0 as well as 20 lanes direct from the CPU. It has long been known that Rocket Lake will include PCIe 4.0 support, but it's also nice to see more lanes as Intel's previous 16 lane offering was not competitive with AMD's Ryzen lineup. We are lacking a number of specifics though. For one, we don't know how power hungry this sort of chip will be, especially at these frequencies. Generally, when companies produce a new architecture which creates a larger CPU core, they combat the increased power requirements by shifting to a smaller process node. In many cases, this can even be more efficient overall. But Intel doesn't have this luxury, so the expectation is that the 11900K will be even more power hungry than 10th gen parts core for core. This leaves us with two explanations for why the 11900K is topping out at 8 cores instead of 10. One is that the power requirements would simply have been too high if they went with 10 cores at up to 4.8 GHz all core. The other is that the larger core design would have occupied too much die space with the 10 core layout, so Intel were limited to 2 8 cores. This is something we'll have to explore further when Intel are ready to talk more about 11th gen. What's already clear about the 11900K is that Intel are basically giving up on the productivity market with this lineup, at least for multi-thread workloads. An 8-core CPU simply won't be competitive there. The strong focus and messaging around Rocket Lake is that of gaming. In fact, Intel even had some performance numbers of their own to show, where the 11900K was between 2 and 8% faster than AMD's Ryzen 9 5900X at 1080p gaming with high to ultra settings. According to the appendix, this testing was done with an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3080 graphics card and 32GB of DDR4-3200 memory in a 4x8GB configuration. While it's nice to get performance numbers and a bit of a preview of what to expect, again, 
there really isn't anything super shocking here. Intel's 10900K is roughly on par with AMD's Ryzen 5000 processors in gaming, so a core architecture update at roughly the same frequencies should see Intel take the lead again for overall gaming performance. There's also still a ton to play out here. For one, a 5% margin is not exactly earth shattering, would usually cast this sort of difference between one product and another as virtually the same. So things like pricing and in today's market availability, those will be key. For example, I don't think the 11900K could get away with being more expensive than a Ryzen processor with those sorts of margins. When things are tight, other stuff like productivity performance and power consumption also comes into play. So personally, I'm very interested to see which direction Intel goes for this lineup. Along with 11th gen processors, Intel are also announcing 500 series chipsets, although Rocket Lake is also backwards compatible with 400 series boards. Intel hasn't shared a lot of information around these motherboards and chipsets yet. I believe they are supposed to be launching today and potentially on sale today. However, motherboard makers are expected to, I think, announce most of their 500 series boards very shortly. The two new features Intel list here are integrated USB 3.2 Gen 2x2 support and a new x8 DMI up from x4 with previous designs. This DMI upgrade is actually quite important, allowing better peripheral and storage connectivity through a wider connection to the CPU. With PCIe 4.0 devices and SSDs becoming more widely available, and many of those parts going to be attached to the chipset, giving more bandwidth through to the CPU is key for maintaining a high level of performance. I suspect this will be one of the main differences between Z590 and Z490. While some Z490 boards will give 11th gen processors access to PCI 4.0 slots for you know, GPUs and M.2 storage, Z590 should have increased chipset capabilities and support for more PCI 4.0 devices. In a way, this could be like the difference between B550 and X570 on the AMD side, where both support PCI 4.0, but X570 gives you better support with more connectivity available. In addition to this, the general expectation is that B560 on the Intel side will now support memory overclocking, which will be key to improving Intel's budget-friendly platform. Aside from the improvements to USB and also the DMI capabilities, we have heard from several motherboard manufacturers that the main thing that they will be using to differentiate Z590 versus Z490 is just better quality motherboards. So within the same product line and the same sort of price points, you will be getting better VRMs, more motherboard layers, just better quality boards overall. And we have heard from some brands in particular that they expect their more entry level products to do even better than you would have seen from Z490. So you should be able to run higher end Intel CPUs, stuff from the 11th gen line in particular, at you know higher clock speeds and better overclocking capabilities across the line. So it does sound like there's not a whole ton of new specific features going into the 500 series chipsets, but you can expect motherboard makers to pull out all the stops with this sort of product line and produce better quality boards. At least that's what we're hearing. We will, of course, have to test that, and Steve will have a lot of fun testing some of those Z590 motherboards in the coming weeks and months. As for Intel's mobile processor line, Intel have announced quite a few processors today, including new vPro stuff and a few Celeron and Pentium parts, but I'm going to ignore those as I don't think they're particularly interesting, especially for our audience. The main stuff that has been shown off is Intel's new Tiger Lake H35 line. The basics here are simple. These are quad-core Tiger Lake processors, essentially the same silicon already being used for Tiger Lake UP3, but instead of power limits topping out at 28 watts, Intel are pushing it up to 35 watts. Combined with the excellent single-thread performance Intel have achieved with Tiger Lake, the thinking is that these 35-watt class CPUs will be suitable for ultra-portable gaming in 15-inch chassis with 16mm Z heights, the sort of class of laptop we saw with, say, the ASUS ROG Zephyrus G14 on the AMD side. You know, 35 watt CPU, 65 watt ish GPU, and a nice compact body. The main consideration here is the inclusion of just four CPU cores, so I don't think we'll see wide adoption outside of these slim gaming machines. And certainly that is Intel's expectation too, based on their presentation. In the short term, until we get eight core Tiger Lake H designs later down the track, which were confirmed today, Intel expects some more performance oriented laptop refreshers to use 10th gen H series, along with Nvidia's soon to be announced RTX 30 GPUs. The timing just hasn't lined up perfectly for eight core Tiger Lake Silicon, so Intel is stuck in a difficult situation here. 
Intel's Tiger Lake H35 series brings most of the features we've seen before with Tiger Lake U processors, such as PCIe Gen 4 and Thunderbolt 4. Again, one of the limitations here for gaming laptop designs will be just four PCIe 4.0 lanes, which will likely keep higher end discrete GPUs out of contention. However, there's DDR4 3200 and LPDDR4X 4266 memory support, and also an interesting addition of resizable bar support, which I'm sure we'll be learning more about over the coming months as more platforms, not just AMD with Ryzen 5000 and Radeon 6000 series products, as they bring support for this PCIe standard. The big thing here is Intel bringing 5 GHz to Tiger Lake for the first time. However, this will only be achieved with one of Intel's three H35 CPUs. That chip is the Core i7-11375H Special Edition, which features a maximum single core turbo speed of 5.0 GHz with all their special boost stuff at play. The other chips, the i7-11370H and i5-11300H, top out at 4.8 and 4.4 GHz respectively. All the four core 8 thread designs with base clocks in the 3 GHz range, with the i7 parts having 12 MB of L3 cache and the Core i5 getting 8 MB. Intel have made several performance claims here, including a range of comparisons between their H35 parts and existing Tiger Lake designs. They're expecting up to 15% better performance than 10th Gen H series Core i7 processors, up to 40% better multi-thread performance than 11th Gen designs at 15 watts, and up to 9% better single thread than 15 watt Tiger Lake. The comparison to 15 watt Tiger Lake there is interesting given that we know from our testing the Tiger Lake benefits a fair bit in both single and multi thread tests from the 28 watt configuration, so I'm curious to see how much better the 35 watt spec actually is. I would be expecting some gains, but probably quite marginal. The other comparison Intel showed is between their 11375H at 35 watts compared to AMD's Ryzen 7 4800HS and Ryzen 9 4900H, showing up to a 30% improvement to single thread performance. Intel are claiming the best single thread performance of any laptop processor, which doesn't surprise me too much given what is on the market right now. However, of course, this is only one part of the story, given the AMD processors listed here and the Core i9-10980HK are all significantly better for multi-thread performance. While there's nothing inherently bad with this lineup, and we've been quite impressed with the performance of Intel's quad-core Tiger Lake processors, especially for low thread count workloads, this does feel like a stopgap launch. With AMD set to announce a more comprehensive suite of Ryzen 5000 processors shortly, including parts that were, we expect will significantly close the single thread gap, this feels a lot like a let's get in early to remind people we exist until 8 core Tiger Lake is ready type of launch than something that will be widely used across laptop designs. In that sense, I'm intrigued to see where and when these processors will be used. So far from what I'm hearing from a few OEMs, it seems like these chips will either make it into mostly lower performance models, think low-end discrete GPUs like Nvidia's MX450, or your sort of budget chassis designs. For most gaming laptop designs, the talk is either a short-term refresh on 10th gen, waiting for 11th gen 8-core designs in a couple of months, or using AMD Ryzen 5000 with that last option, I think being surprisingly popular. Intel's other announcements were around stuff like vPro processors, which are business-oriented, not something of great interest to me. There are also a set of new Pentium and Celeron chips, the hearts of which you can see here on screen, although we don't usually cover this mark as, it, as it's mostly education-focused. So that's it for today's Intel news and announcements. Very much a holding pattern type reveal, and I think Intel releasing this information first was in their best interests, as I can't imagine there being as much interest after the launch of AMD's new CPUs and Nvidia's new GPUs. I'm definitely interested in testing out the H35 processors and seeing how they stack up, but ultimately the big important stuff from Intel is still a few months away. For now, they're just tidying us over with the H35 line, the teaser for the 11900K, and also the the release of 500 series motherboards. Anyway, that's it for this news video. We will be back a few more times this week to chat about all the rest of the stuff that will be announced at CES. If you're interested in supporting the channel, we do have our Patreon float plan accounts. Links to those are in the description below. You can also subscribe. Great way to do it without having to hand over any money. And yeah, that's it. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next one.